We will begin the webinar in approximately two minutes. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today, Undisclosed Breach Intelligence, a Game Changer for Compliance, Auditing, and Risk Management. My name is Stacy Taylor. I'm Marketing Director here at Prevalian, and I will be your host today. In a few moments, our featured speaker, Kareem Hajazi, CEO and founder of Prevalian, will begin the presentation. If you have any questions during his presentation, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and submit your question. We will have a Q&A session at the end. This webinar is being recorded and we will be sending all registrants and attendees the recording within the next few days. And finally, at the end of the session today, there will be a brief survey. We value your feedback and appreciate it if you could fill it out. Without any further delay, let's get started. Kareem, take it away. Thank you, Stacy. I appreciate that. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. This is one of the webinars that I've been waiting to do for well over a couple of years since incepting Prevalian. Uh, as the title suggests, Undisclosed Breach Intelligence. It's one of the most compelling and arguably controversial subjects out there. Breach is truly a problem and it's becoming more of a problem as we go into a, a actual biological pandemic. Uh, because of the nature of, of how adversaries work. Through this webinar, I aim to show you uh, a little bit around the game-changing aspects of how we're approaching the problem, some of the solutions we figured out, and, and the way forward that I think will actually fundamentally change the game for uh, not only practitioners in the security space and in compliance and auditing, but also to disrupt the adversarial initiative altogether. Before we start, a little background about myself. Again, my name is Kareem Hijazi. I'm the founder and CEO of Prevalian. I've come from close to 20 plus years of cybersecurity and counterintelligence experience. I founded the first counterintelligence consultancy for private sector uh, organizations, primarily around oil and big pharma in the late 1990s. I moved that organization into, into uh, counterintelligence around 2001, 2002, that company was called Demiurge Consulting. And so I'm a consultant by nature. So quite frankly, building product was something that wasn't even on the radar for me for a, quite a long time. Uh, close to 2009 and 10, I got involved with some of the groups pursuing some of the larger botnets that were plaguing uh, a lot of commercial industry and government. Things like Stormbot and most notably Mariposa, which was a very large botnet uh, that actually facilitated the birth of a number of organizations, not including, you know, including things like FireEye, uh, Dumbala, for those that remember those types of companies. Uh, in that time frame, we were able to pioneer an interesting approach to being able to infiltrate and access command and control infrastructure associated with those botnets. It was so successful that I was able to memorialize that in the form of a company called Unvalence in 2010. I founded that company uh, in late 2010 run it, ran it for about 
about two years and had it acquired by Mandiant in 2012, which is now FireEye for those who don't recognize the name Mandiant. Um, took a, a number of years uh, off reassessing the landscape, understanding what might be more of a, a challenge. And in late 2017, built the first MVP of the prevailing Apex platform, primarily focused around supply chain threat. That seemed to be the black box that no one had figured out how to, how to address. Every organization I spoke with regarding how they manage their supply chain problems indicated that the best they could really find were the scorecard companies, which obviously provide a tremendous value as far as hygiene, but they were very limited on understanding the systemic success or failure of compromise within these organizations. So it gave me the idea that ultimately, if we could employ very similar methodologies and tactics we did during Unbalance and Mandiant, uh, but with now technology 10 years later, we'd be quite effective in understanding a little bit more of what's going on. What's interesting about what's evolved over the years is with Unbalance, we were addressing something that was along the lines of data leak intelligence, which was kind of an outcropping from data leak prevention or DLP solutions, if, if those of you that were in the industry remember that. And really it was a, a strange terminology for something that really ultimately was effectively compromised intelligence, which we've now pioneered here with, with Prevalian. But it was a good start. It got us a pretty good understanding of victimology. It let us understand how prolific and pervasive some of these adversaries were. That was dramatically enhanced by Mandiant's acquisition of Unvalence. We were able to augment our intelligence with an instant response capability that Mandiant was known for. And we were very effective in, in executing on post-compromise situations. While that was very good and, and helped usher in a whole new era of consultants and instant response teams, um, I left prior to the FireEye acquisition of Mandiant and, as I mentioned, went off to pursue other initiatives. But what was still missing was an idea about understanding effectively the systemic success or failure of organizations as a whole. How well do they manage compromise when it happens? Do they actually impact uh, the problem while it's still viable to, to attack or do they simply have no idea what's going on? And part of the initiative with Prevailing was to understand that for the organization directly, as well as understand whether that was happening due to a third party uh, you know, association or affiliation. So it began as a compromise intelligence play to understand who might be susceptible or contagious. And then it grew into the next phase of this, which is what we're introducing today, which is breach intelligence. Understanding with empirical and irrefutable facts that there has indeed been breach. And that's what we're gonna be covering today. I call it a cyber pandemic, not simply because we're in a biological one, but because it really is one. Uh, and what I mean by that is from an adversarial standpoint, it's just too perfect. It's a lucrative agenda and initiative. It requires very little on their part to do much other than standing up certain amounts of cloud infrastructure that's very, very cheap effectively. They can also be quite anonymous, not entirely, otherwise we wouldn't be effective, but for the most part, they can pretty much do this without leaving any kind of footprint. It's incredibly scalable and repeatable. And what I mean by that is it's quite a formulaic approach for many of these adversaries. Once they find a vector of infection into a victim, they can repeat that process over and over and over again. Not only in, in new victims, but the same ones over and over again. Once you're on the list, you tend to stay on the list, which is really unfortunate. Um, not only are they you know, working to achieve their own ends, they actually gain access and then broker it out to others. So there's quite the syndicate and in, in an environment of cooperation among these adversaries that's quite problematic. And what that facilitates is an economy of scale. It makes it more cost effective and it makes it even more lucrative than if they were working independently. So this becomes quite a challenge when it comes to dealing with an adversary when they're working together and in cooperation. Uh, it really effectively gives little chance to, to the victim to, to manage something like that once they've been infiltrated and compromised. And adding to that, you're dealing with an unchecked attack surface of most organizations. And what I mean by that is, not only was this bad enough before the COVID-19 pandemic where security was stretched to the limit as far as trying to armor themselves up and limit the exposure of their own ecosystems, it was harder that they had the third party ecosystems. And then you add to that work from home environments where there literally is no security. And the best you can hope for is antivirus and a VPN. That, that just essentially gave the adversary that much more access. 
And so we've watched a force multiplication problem manifest due to the actual biological pandemic that's caused everyone to work from home. You add the third party contagion aspect to that, which is not just now another organization or supply chain partner that could be an IOT device in your house that facilitates access to your corporate environment, which is really problematic. And then I think the most tragic and sort of disheartening aspect of all of this is many of these compromises and breaches go completely either unknown or even worse so undisclosed. Meaning despite all the regulations and policies and protocols that organizations have to live up to to disclose things, in many cases they don't. And many reasons why they choose not to is reputational impact and fear, embarrassment, pride, uh, the fact that they believe it may not be material enough for the fact that it'll, it won't matter and it really isn't something that is worthy of, of disclosing. And frankly, it's very expensive. So sadly, choices made here are, are really critical. And I think that unfortunately, whether we like it or not, facing the reality that breaches a pandemic and it's something that's gonna continue and only get worse requires us to change the game entirely. Time is of the essence when it comes to breach. If you look at what I've got here, you've got a blue line which indicates a timeline. It all begins with an initial compromise. And this is setting the lexicon for this webinar as a whole. The initial compromise could be something as simple as a phishing attempt by an adversary on an, on an unwitting victim that deploys a Trojan within the environment. That Trojan then facilitates a dropper of some kind that then conducts a breach, which is either some sort of data exfiltration, payload collection, network survey data, PII, intellectual property, you name it. And that's when that event happens. So the initial compromise may be the adversary lurking within the environment, not necessarily doing anything yet, but just simply waiting for the right time to strike. The breach event is indeed when there's really no turning back. Data has now left the organization and is now in the wild. This is typically when most organizations will start to sense something may be wrong, uh, hopefully, and try to do some sort of discovery uh, and management of that problem. That's effectively when the discovery and disclosure begins. Once the discovery has been made, incident response gets involved, uh, and, and the, the whole process continues. Problem here is post-breach response is typically limited. In many cases, organizations don't even know what to tell their constituents and their stakeholders and their investors. In most cases, we've seen the memes on Twitter where they say, we know something happened in the last two years. We think data might've been taken. We're not quite sure who it is. We'll let you know. It's the worst breach response we've ever seen. And it's continuing to get worse and worse because the adversaries are able to cover their tracks pretty well. The biggest problem with all of this is obviously the reputational impact and the stakeholder confidence of the in the organizations that are breached. Uh, now, we've seen this happen with a number of high profile organizations. They have recovered. But unfortunately, it has not been without a certain amount of toll on their, on their reputation and their business. And now more than ever, the last thing organizations need is any further detraction from usage. Uh, getting companies uh, in a place where they can actually continu continue to do work without being impacted by something like an adversary is critical. And in this time frame that I'm showing here, there's a period of time that is absolutely the most critical. That red line is the critical period when you can make a difference. It is entirely in that time frame that an organization can choose their fate. And really, it's the same as the dwell time. Now, that dwell time can extend beyond that red. It can actually go out entirely through and never be discovered, just to be clear. Booz Allen Hamilton recommends or suggests that there's an average dwell time of 200 to 250 days. In fact, that's gone up since my Mandian days when I think it was somewhere to 140 to 170 days. So the unfortunate story here is that it doesn't look like the dwell time of the adversary is getting any less. It's in fact growing. And so the problem here is the ability to get in either even before the initial compromise and limit your exposure to something that would facilitate that or getting in between the initial compromise and the breach event is absolutely critical for the survival of an organization. So we at Prevalian really do believe in changing the game. That's not just a uh, lip service. We're quite aggressive in our approach. We believe offense is truly the best defense. I have a picture of a turtle here because to me, the last 20 years in cybersecurity has represent, been represented very well by that, that animal. Everyone's trying to armor themselves up and limit their exposure and basically stay hunkered down and hope the adversary eventually goes away once they can't get through the shell. The problem is 
a really sophisticated predator could spend all day long hammering at that shell until they get into that soft flesh underneath. And that's the nature of how adversaries see victims. They don't look at them as anything other than something that needs to be cracked open and accessed. Our recommendation is to become more like a porcupine. If an adversary is indeed going to come after you, you might as well make it painful for them. You might as well impact their infrastructure, make it more expensive for them, have them think about the vector, have them consider that they indeed might be tracked if they come after you. They might actually have a spine or a quill in them when they leave and not be able to actually effectively get to where they want to go. So our strategy is to start changing the game on the adversary rather than trying to change the game from the victim side, because we've done that for the 20, for 20 some years that we've been at this and it hasn't worked. We truly believe in adversarial pursuit. The goal here isn't to identify victims uh, directly and go contact them and have a conversation with them and address what may have happened. While that's valuable and useful and many companies do that very, very well, our agenda is to go actually find the adversaries, identify their infrastructure, and determine exactly where they're acting and how they're acting. And from there, infiltrate that. By infiltrating that command and control infrastructure, we're able to see what they see. We're able to identify who the victims are in that ecosystem that they've established. Those botnets now illuminate to us and we, we're able to understand at scale who the victims are associated with different threat groups and, and malware types. And most importantly, we do this with absolutely zero customer touch. There is no hardware, there's no software, there's no configuration changes. We're not even so much as a DNS change like an umbrella or an ultra DNS. We simply require the malware to communicate to the command and control as it was intended to do in order for us to understand which organization's been compromised. A little bit about how we do what we do. This is always the biggest question we get. No one can generally understand how we can possibly collect that intelligence without somehow get, garnering it from the organization directly. And the truth is we actually do. The reality is we're not deploying anything. It's already been deployed. The malware is the agent that effectively provides us the intelligence. The way it all starts is just like any other situation. The compromised organization has malware that infects it. That malware then resides silently within the organization with the exception of communicating to its command and control. That is a critical part of the equation. Without that, it cannot modify itself. It cannot evade detection. It can't adapt to the environment that is there to defend, to defend against it. So it needs to be as versatile as the security apparatuses that are in place to, pre to prevent it. By communicating with DNS servers, that malware can then get an IP assignment to then contact an actual command and control environment. And that is where the communications work back and forth. The malware gets new versions of itself. It's able to deploy payload. It's able to deploy stolen material. And those malicious C2 servers are essentially a dumping ground where further information is brokered out into the dark and, dark and deep web, for example. Uh, or it's able to get a new version of itself to evade detection by antivirus or IDS solutions. Prevalian has found a way to impact this tremendously. We allow it to do exactly what it was intended to do. But when it does reach out to get an IP assigned to it, we're able to actually collect that evidence of compromise. We can see that that malware is indeed communicating with the command and control environment of some kind. And we can collect that and memorialize it and timestamp it. But even further, and this is what we're coming out with now, which is the evidence of breach, we're able to modify that IP assignment. What that allows us to do is now be part of that collection apparatus, which is instead of just having the malicious C2 server collect the payload that's leaving the organization, we're also part of that collection. And we do that with, again, zero hardware, zero software, and zero configuration at the compromised organization front. No knowledge of any kind is necessary by the victim and certainly by the adversary. We're able to collect that unbeknownst to anyone. And that evidence of breach is something we'll get into here further in the, web, in the webinar. This approach is fundamentally different than any, anything we've ever seen in the past. The, the fundamental issue with some of the vulnerability assessment companies or the ones that are doing surveys and asking people how they're doing is that they're only getting a point in time assessment of what's happening. They're getting an understanding of how well the organization has managed their hygiene. And while that's valuable to a degree, it's only transient and limited as far as the time that it actually happens. And there's a lot of false positives with it. You don't necessarily know who you're scanning sometimes. And if you're gonna to suggest to get this working in a continuous manner, you're effectively gonna DDoS your victim or, or your, your client in this case. You're gonna be pounding on the outside of their infrastructure trying to determine what's, 
accessible to them and, and leave them in more of a vulnerable state than you started. By, by approaching it from a compromise standpoint, the entirety of the ecosystem that's been compromised by the adversaries visible to us, that big red dot you see there is the command and control infrastructure that has been defected by Prevalian and is working as a cyber informant by us. That gives us the ability to continuously monitor all the victimology of an organization inside and outside. So that means their own organization as well as their third party ecosystems. We're also able to identify the actor and the intent. So if this is an APT 34 group out of Iran with an intention to disrupt an oil facility of some kind, we'll be able to tell you that. We're also gonna be able to tell you about the proliferation and spread of that. We're gonna be able to understand exactly where this thing is moving, how it's laterally moving from one computer to another or one organization to another by way of connectivity. Third party contagion, as I've mentioned several times already, is probably the biggest problem here. You'll be able to identify very quickly that a third party that you are actively working with or you're thinking about working with represents a contagious entity in your, in your world. Further, we can give you context on vertical targeting. So is it the oil sector that this actor is working at? Is it, are they going after the financial industry? Are they going after the health industry? What's happening here? We see a proliferation across several hospitals all in one day. It's the same actor, it's the same infrastructure, it's the same malware. You may be next on the list if you're in that industry or sector. And we have absolute global coverage. The beauty of our solution is we're going after the convergence point of where the communications come to. We're not going after the endpoints. And what that facilitates is a tremendously interesting view of compromise. We see data exfil every organization on the planet from a threat that is focused on by us in real time. And we see the severity, the frequency, the cadence and the velocity of it in real time. These visuals are indeed something that we're gonna be releasing in Q4 uh, that are actually maneuverable by you as a client. You can look, you can spin a globe around, you can click a pin, you can de define exactly what you wanna see in a moment that you need to see it. That globe showed a lot of pins, and this is really what it would suggest. We've seen 27.8 billion malicious beacons in the last 180 days. Those have come from 200,000 plus compromised IP addresses, manifesting from 22,000 different compromised organizations in over 200 industry groups. So while this information is quite bleak, and it's not exactly the information I would have liked to share about any kind of good news, it's the reality. And unfortunately, it is getting worse. That being said, we do have a solution for this. We have built the first truly SaaS based compromise search engine out there. And beyond being a compromise search engine, which you'll be able to access immediately, and we are gonna be providing free access to everyone on this webinar to get to their compromised data, we will be releasing in Q4 the breach intelligence component of the solution, which I'm gonna be showing you here. And again, it's instant access. There's nothing other than an email address and a, and a username, well, which is your email address, and your password to access it via the web. And again, no hardware, no software, no configuration changes. And for those that do need alerting in an API, that's absolutely in there. We built a, a pane of glass for people to be able to use the data in a way that's manageable, but we understand that many organizations are gonna to wanna to ingest the data directly into whatever system they use. The platform works just like any other search engine out there. You can put an organizational name in, you can put an IP address, you can put a site or IP. Depending on your sophistication level or where you live in the organization, if you simply need to search based on a, a Boolean string or a name like bank or insurance or China, you're welcome to do that as well and get a lot of contacts and exactly what's going on. For those that want much more granularity or the entire infrastructure is in the cloud, be it at GCP or Azure or AWS, you can put a CIDR in that is ephemeral or an IP address that's specific to that time frame, And it will give you context on whether that organization or that IP has been compromised. Once you have a search that's been conducted, you'll be given a list of organizations and IP addresses associated with that search. And in, in a fairly decent amount of detail in the preview pane, you'll get a certain number of malware families identified and families are split into two components. One is the weapon and the other is the actor. We don't consider them one and the same. So if it's a telebots infection facilitated by APT28, you'll know that. If it's something that's an unknown binary that we simply have the hash for because it's an O day, we'll tell you that as well. The key thing here is being able to give you very quick, very definitive empirical evidence that you can act on immediately. 
And for those of you that don't have any interest in the malware families and the IP addresses and the events, we do provide Apex Seeker Edition, which allows you to just look at the criticality of the organization. And that's essentially the stoplight coloration with trending. So you'll see nothing below that critical moniker and you'll have a little trending arrow giving you an under indication of how the organization is doing. And from there, if you want further detail, you can choose to look at it or not. For those that wanna go deeper, we provide a very robust detail page of the organization. We provide organizational name or IP address, if that's what you're looking for. A timeline with scrubbers to look at information up to 180 days and a specific time frame that you can zero in into, down into. And the key statistics that include severity status, compromised IP addresses, malware, beacon count, and exfiltration event count. The key thing here is trying to deliver value around knowing definitively that through this time frame, there was compromise. And exactly at these points, those purple lines at the bottom spark line is when actual exfiltration events happened. And these are data points that correlate to what you might get with something like a deep and dark web scanning company later. What we will see in real time, you may find six weeks, six months, six years later on a dark and deep web you know, forum somewhere. So the key is time again, get there before it gets out into the open. It may be too late, but at least acting rapidly and efficiently is the best thing you can possibly do in a post-breach situation. The detail of the breach is tremendous. We provide exfiltration event details, including number of files and volume of data exfilled. We can see a sub-menu of the inventory, and the inventory is a searchable inventory of file types collected and identified. And that does include the actual file types, sizes, and dates. So if it's a screenshot from someone's screen buffer that was harvested by a malware and exfiltrated to the command and control, we'll collect it, we'll hash it, and we'll have it available for an organization to be able to, to parse through. Now, there'll probably be many questions around what kind of data we can, we can provide to different groups. We are limited to some degree about providing a, an abundance of information because it can be very disruptive to an organization. But we do need that information to be disclosed so organizations can take the proper action, either as a victim or as an organization that is contending with a contagious entity so they can prevent that contagion from happening to them. Think about it from a COVID standpoint. If you know that you're dealing with an organization that is an asymptomatic cyber contagious entity, you need to digitally distance yourself from them to take a term right out of the news. Once you've found a series of organizations or a group of them that you find to be compelling and you wanna continuously monitor, we, build, we built effectively what we considered the cyber Bloomberg terminal out there, which is a portfolio view of every organization that may be of interest to you. And that can include existing partners, prospective partners, potential M&A targets, industry peers, all of which are colorized by severity and compromised trending. And this is where you can set alerting. So if an organization shifts from one severity level to another, you'll be able to get an alert on that. We are very sensitive to alert fatigue, so we're being very cautious about trying to be overabundant with it. Again, don't forget, we're purely signal. We're not noise and signal. So there's no need to sort of say, well, I got an IOC from Prevailing, I'm gonna go through it. You're never gonna get an IOC from us. You're gonna either get an EOC, which is an evidence of compromised data point, or better yet, you're gonna get an evidence of breach or EOB data point to work with. Some of the key direct and third-party impacts with our, our solution are real-time awareness. Again, as I mentioned, when something happens, we're gonna tell you about it. We're not gonna go and try to scrape or hunt for it on the dark web. That's critical, back to time. And you're gonna hear me say that over and over again. Materiality of breach, huge, massive, huge for compliance, huge for, for insurance. Once you understand the nature of what did leave, you can make informed decisions going forward. Not only as the victim, but as a service provider for the victim. Severity and scope, back to the actor, the malware types, and the, the impact of that. Are we dealing with an APT group? Are we dealing with a nation state group? Is GRU behind this? Is it a script kitty in Toledo, Ohio in his basement? We need to know a little bit more about that before we can make some informed judgments. And that's exactly what we provide. Persistence of the adversary, which has direct impact on that breach timeline. How much do they stay in there? Did the IR team come in and just get rid of the first stage and go out for beers afterwards successfully saying they killed it all and then the master boot record actually reinstalls the malware that was there prior to, to the, uh, the incident response team leaving. How is the post breach response being managed? What is the spin control play here? How are you gonna deal with press and media around this? More information is good, less information is bad. 
being able to tell your stakeholders and your constituents and your customers that you know exactly what happened and you're, you're, you're regretful of the situation, but you're on top of it. That's a huge difference between saying, I have no idea what happened, we'll let you know. Disclosure playbooks absolutely are impacted by this capability. Insurance, policy and claim both. So policy issuance for one, so helping organizations that are considering getting into cyber insurance or actually getting a policy, this would help educate substantially, not to mention actually impacting the claims uh, issuance as well. Compliance and governance, pretty straightforward and obvious here. If an organization ultimately has a breach, there's been a compliance failure. There's something that has gone awry. Something has been happened to where something that would have prevented this has ultimately happened. In many cases, if it's something that was completely outside the realm of their ability to manage it, we understand, but it's better to know that than not. Some standard use cases here, and I've covered quite a few of these already, but I think it's, it's good to go over them more succinctly here. Third party risk management, something that's become a, a word that we've all heard now for the last several years. Limit your exposure to compromised partner organizations. Worse yet, if you know they're compromised, don't send your data to them. <laughs> Limit your exposure to organizations that could lose your data. This isn't simply about an island hopping problem where if you're interacting with an organization that has compromised, that adversary is going to find their way into you. You might actually have management of that gateway. But if you're sending data to a compromised partner with weak OPSEC, you're going to lose your data. GRC, identify and confirm undisclosed compliance failures. How much do you believe what you get back in those surveys? Qualify it, quantify it, trust but verify. Insurance, develop empirical actuarial models based on that evidence of breach. If you actually need that level of detail and fidelity, we've got it now. Incident response, identify and remediate compromise and active breach. This was the dream for Mandiant. When we were able to allow the consultants to walk in armed to the teeth with knowledge of exactly what happened before they even go in through the front door, they look like wizards. They already were, and they looked even better when they walked in. So it's an incredibly powerful capability to get tactical with it. From a preemptive and proactive use case standpoint, ransomware, something that we can't watch the news without hearing about. Ransomware doesn't just happen. Ransomware is facilitated. It comes in by way of, of droppers, like, like Trojans or whatever the case may be. Several weeks ago, Prevalian in a, in a gratis capacity, in a pro bono capacity, helped several hospitals that were infected by CACBOT, something that's been around for 10 years because it's now teamed up with ProLocker ransomware. We were able to get ahead of it by addressing that dropper, which actually limited the exposure of them to the ransomware attack all, all at once. And now they're actually better for it. M&A, getting into the profit centering around our intelligence. Modify the deal terms based on newly discovered evidence of breach. Just imagine exactly what Verizon and Yahoo might have done with this type of intelligence. Or imagine what maybe Marriott and SPG would have done if they had witnessed that an organization they were looking to acquire indeed was compromised or breached in advance of the deal. That could also include things like you know, M&A insurance. Doesn't necessarily mean the deal doesn't have to happen. Investment, predict likely breach based on historical remediation performance. This is the best possible tool you can possibly use for, for due diligence purposes. When you understand the systemic success or failure of an organization over time, you're better informed to make a very good judgment on an investment, whether that's a, a long or a short. Targeted attacks, very important aspect here. Look at your industry peers. If you're Coca-Cola and you share a third party contractor with Pepsi and that third party contractor is compromised, you're as much risk as they are from getting compromised. That cyber typhoid Mary is what you're looking out for in this case. And specific actors are gonna go for those weak points in the ecosystem. And with that said, I'm happy to move into Q&A. Thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you, Kareem. We will begin the Q&A session now. Uh, we've, re we've received a number of great questions. Um, first one is, do you let the organizations know when you identify a breach? Yes, we do. So we will literally provide the organization that is working with us the evidence of the breach and compromise so they can make an informed judgment on it. Um, now, we are sensitive to sharing certain amounts of detail with third parties. So for example, if there's information that has been collected that is the proprietary intelligence or IP of a given organization, we're not gonna go and share those details in high fidelity with another organization. We will say that there has indeed been something there, 
but we've already spoken with the organization about it. It's up to them to share the, that level of detail. Um, because we have had questions with organizations saying, if I've shared data with a compromised third party, will you be able to tell me if my data was among what was stolen? And the answer is, well, as prevailing, we may know what was taken, but it's not us to sort of parse through that and deliver bits and pieces. We'll allow those organizations to correspond and communicate that with law enforcement's assistance, of course. Okay, and next question. If one of my partners is a breach victim or compromised, can I share the details from the platform with them? The answer is yes. Um, we do encourage our customers to speak with their third parties about the fact that they are working with Prevalian to have preemptive intelligence on any kind of compromise status. We do encourage them to have their partners reach out to us so that they can get an account and actually see the data firsthand. So if you're company A working with company B that is your subcontractor and company A is a Prevalian customer and company B is their partner, we would request that company A share light details around what they see in the platform that they are limiting their exposure and throttling their connectivity with that organization so that they can actually protect themselves and to go ahead and get in touch with us so that we can provide access to the data that they're seeing as well. And we do not charge for that. We allow organizations to see their own telemetry for free, which is part of the process here. Our goal is to help clean up the problem. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, how is this legal? <laughs> That's a great question. This does feel very much like a sort of hack back approach. If we were out there getting into command and control servers without any kind of permission or, th or authority, we'd be a very short lived organization. What we've established over the last 10 years are strong proprietary and exclusive relationships with providers in concert with law enforcement to be able to provide evidence of maliciousness around C2 infrastructure so that they can make changes. Now they have a choice in their changes. They can either point things to a shut down, you know, closed down suspended state. They can take them down entirely, or they can alter the direction of that traffic to in infrastructure that we set up. And that is entirely in their purview to do. And they're able to do it uh, without any kind of rule breaking. They're simply protecting themselves because it's part of their terms of service or EULA. So we're banking off providing them evidence that they otherwise wouldn't have. And then we benefit from their alteration of certain records for us to be able to see the traffic. So we actually do not put our hands on anything. We're simply the unwitting recipients of that data. And then we provide that data via the platform. Great. Um... The next question is, do you integrate with Seam solutions? If so, yeah. can you explain how that looks? Certainly, yeah, that's a great question. So the data is formed in a way that it can be actually ingested into everything from a Splunk to an Exabeam to an Arc site. Uh, so the data comes in the form of an egress IP address. It's a routable public facing IP address that belongs to the victim. The C2 environment that we have identified and have defected and made it made work for us effectively, which includes the actual domain as well as the IP. And then most importantly, the timestamp down to the microsecond that can be correlated against DNS logs or other logs that the SIM may have. So that is absolutely available via an API. Great. Um, next question is, what is the rate of false positives? So we consider a false positive something like a sandbox or security researcher that actually is indeed communicating with the command control environment. In many cases, it is hard for us sometimes to tell whether it is a sandbox or a researcher, but in other cases, it is easier because there is a cadence and velocity and frequency that we'll see change pretty rapidly if it's a sandbox environment. We're not likely to see anything that is going to be a false positive when we get into our evidence of breach. It is possible with the evidence of compromise, like I mentioned. The reason why we're effectively false positive free when it comes to the EOB is because we're actually moving the traffic from being a DNS call, which could be something that's very limited in the meta data associated with it. It's simply one UDP call from the malware to a, to a DNS server. While we collect that and consider it important, especially if we see it over and over again over the course of 180 days, which is a good indicator that it's not a false positive, what's empirical 
is when we actually issue an IP address back to the malware and then we actually get the malware to communicate to us IP to IP. And from there, we've, we know definitively that we're dealing with a malware infestation of some kind. Typically because if it is a sandbox, it's been left un, unsupervised and is running and might as well be a real compromise. Great. Um, the next question is, how does your licensing model work? Sure. So it's a subscription. The platform, again, is available via web-based access. Uh, we provide annual subscriptions to the data. We sell based on numbers of organizations a given customer is looking to look at and continuously monitor through the course of a year. We do have a solution called Apex Seeker that is a more light version that is probably more appropriate for compliance professionals. It doesn't provide the depth of fidelity around the malware types, the actors and the telemetry because it generally is not as important to those folks. And that allows you to search to your heart's content through Seeker, which is our search utility for any organization for an entirety of a year and look at any organization through that time frame and understand their severity over time. Um, we do have an enterprise model for pricing. We also do have an entry level, which we sell in the form of vision packs. And vision packs are basically 10 organizations at a time uh, for continuous monitoring throughout the year. Thanks, Kareem. Um, the next question is, sounds like Prevalian needs to have at least one piece of malware somewhere to phone home from patient zero before it detects a breach. Can it do anything before breach happens? Yes, that's, yeah, a, that's really a really good question. Um, the, the, this gets into a little bit of our process pre-effectively uh, infiltration of C2. So to the person's question around that, our process actually starts with malware detonation ourselves. So we ingest somewhere to the tune of about 300 to 500,000 samples of malware a day. Our biggest challenge is exactly which ones to pursue. So once we have an understanding of the command and control infrastructure associated with that malware, we then pursue it. And in many cases, we actually pursue C2s that are yet to be weaponized. So along those lines, we're able to get ahead of that and preemptively understand which test bed infrastructure is being run by infrastructure, by adversaries, to then say, hey, this looks like something that's gonna be tested out uh, in the next few days and is likely gonna be going after the oil sector. Now, while we're not a defensive tool, so I wanna be very clear, we don't provide feeds of C2 for building YAR rules or any kind of blocking and tackling. We are still a post analysis capability there. We can provide a certain amount of context on this looks like it's impending and coming. Um, but to the other question prior, which is tied to SIM, it wouldn't be a bad thing for us to be able to deliver that same kind of uh, information around C2s to products that can actually preemptively limit exposure that way. So that is a possibility that we could work with. And uh, the next question we have is, as bots are prevalent, how does your product identify malicious bots? Um, trying to understand the question specifically. So as, um, as botnets sort of manifest, I'm assuming that's the question, which is as, as botnets sort of grow and laterally move out, how, are we, how do we identify their existence? Um, I'm gonna answer it to the degree that I think I understand it, which is that we are watching for scale and growth so from one day to the next or one week to the next, we'll watch the proliferation of different malware within different environments beacon back. So as we see the frequency and cadence of the beacons manifest from that same binary to a command and control environment, we can see the growth and scale and lateral movement and spread of it. Um, I hope I'm answering that person's question. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, do you collect malware samples from the wild, from the organizations that contract with you? Yes and yes, that's a really good question. So we collect, we have our own collection methodology, which includes uh, our own ability to collect in the wild, as well as partnering to get those malware samples. But uh, my favorite method is indeed from our customers. If our customers have the means to capture something off the wire, and either detonate it themselves and provide a C2 infrastructure to pursue, or if they just need to provide the binary to us, we can actually work with that. And that is sometimes the best way for us to understand what's actually a viable threat to pursue because it's actually something that was in a corporate environment or governmental environment. 
So that is absolutely something that we endorse and, and embrace uh, with our customers, which makes them more of an intelligence partner than just a customer. Great. Well, uh, we have reached the end of the Q&A time and that concludes the webinar. Thank you very much, Kareem. If your question wasn't answered, we'll reach out to you individually. Please remember to complete the survey at the end and thank you so much for joining. Have a great rest of your day.